around sustainability mostly. Um, sometimes within the transportation world, and sometimes um, within urban development and uh, rural community development as well. So okay. I'm very, very happy to be here and back in Vermont. Uh -huh. So uh, where, where did you come back to Vermont? Were you, is this a, you're saying you come back to Vermont? Yep. Where, Senator Bray, where, we're live. Okay, all right, so good morning. It is January 13th, 836. We're having a slightly late start because we had a technical hiccup. This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. And today we're uh, meeting with our partners at ANR to um, talk about um, the last year and what's coming uh, in terms of uh, our committee. Like every legislative committee is starting from the vantage point of how we've been doing and how these operating areas are impacted by the pandemic. Uh, what have we seen so far? What's on? Uh, what are areas, uh, operating areas, looking forward to in 21, uh, in terms of impacts on operations, and does it change budget requirements as well, so that we uh, will have a sense of what's coming our way. So, uh, good morning, and we'll start with our our first uh, guest witness of the day is. Uh, um, Ms. Shendrin, the Deputy Secretary of Agency Natural Resources. So welcome to the committee. And um, just before we went live, you were starting to introduce yourself. So Thank um, you. please go ahead. Thank you. Sure. My name is Maggie Gendron, and I just recently started as the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Natural Resources. I'm originally from Clear, Vermont, and have spent the majority of my career working on the intersection of federal and state policy around sustainability. So I'm really pleased to be here. I'm with my colleagues as well. And um, Emily Byrne is going to be um, offering a presentation this morning. So I really look forward to working with you. Thank you uh, for introducing me this morning. Okay. Uh, well, welcome and thanks for joining us. I'll look forward to um, working more with you and uh, someday even in person, the old fashioned yes. way. I look yeah. forward to that very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, good, good morning, Ms. Byrne. Good to see you again. Morning. Good to see you. Um, do you, uh, do you want to do a screen share or something like that? Sure. That would be great. Um, I thought this morning I could talk through, we have a, a spreadsheet that has all of the CARES Act money that came to the agency this past year. I thought that would be right. a good place to start in terms of okay. where we spent money. Um, and sort of how that impacted agency operations this past year. Um, Commissioner Snyder is here as well. Um, I've told him he can jump in as he needs to, um, but he has a presentation about specifically forests and parks that he'll go into after. So I will sort of keep it very high level and let him um, speak more. And he got most of the money, so he should probably get the most air time. So, uh, Ms. Um, Byrne, you're all set to share the screen. Wonderful. I will do that. And then tell me if you can see it because it's kind of a, it's a, we know. <laughs> um, <laughs> perfect. Um, it says, I'm getting a message that it says disabled participant screen sharing. So I don't know. I don't know why you're getting that, but you are co host. So you should be able to do anything, you know. Mm. I'll try it again. Okay. There go, something just flashed. So, should I zoom in further or does this work? You hit screen save. Did you hit screen share? Oh, I mean, I did not. Now I did. You have to, you have to do that. Great. Here we go. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, so, at a very high level, the agency got about $12.2 million of CARES Act fund. Um, thanks to the legislature's appropriations last summer and fall. Um, the first appropriation that the agency got was in the supplemental budget adjustment that was done last spring. Those funds were specifically allocated for um, sanitation and sanitization at state facilities um, and to with um, provide PPE for state employees and to make sure that state employees could be safe. Um, at a high level, I should say at a high level, the sort of three um, 
goals over the past year for the agency were to both protect staff, so make sure that staff were still able to do their jobs to provide services to Vermonters, be that for providing PPE, you know, glass partitions at the contact stations at forests and parks, making sure that there were additional tools for staff that in a normal situation they would have shared, but in, during COVID, we didn't want people sharing tools. So making sure people had extra stuff, protecting the public, making sure um, that the public can continue to utilize state resources without sort of health and safety risks. So be that through reducing some of the occupancy at state parks, bringing hunter education online. Um, and we'll probably go into more detail, but also deploying um, more portalettes across the state at state lands to make sure that we could reduce occupancy of bathroom facilities, but to also make sure that there are facilities um, in places that there aren't brick and mortar um, bathrooms. Um, and the sort of third goal, right, was to protect the land, to make sure that people would be able to socially distance when they visited um, these areas, ensure that, you know, as people needed to get out more this summer after being cooped up, that there was, um, wasn't going to be additional damage associated with more traffic, both foot and um, at parking areas, um, and making sure that all of those areas were accessible. So sort of as we go through those things, I think you'll hear the, that theme of protecting the staff, protecting the land and protecting um, Vermonters while using our resources throughout. So I'll jump back in um, at that sort of sanitization piece. You'll see in this first column, this is the original appropriation that was provided by the legislature. In blue is what was reallocated through the Joint Fiscal Committee. So it, initially when this was all very new, we had estimated needing about $2 million for the sanitization efforts at state lands. We ended up spending about a million dollars of that um, just based on where actuals came in compared to budget. And as I'm sure you're all aware, there was a reallocation process throughout the year where the administration kind of touched base with the joint fiscal committee to determine sort of how spending was tracking. And then if there was any, any money um, that looked like it wasn't gonna be spent was reallocated to places where it could be deployed. Um, the second place that the agency saw an appropriation was in the, the first quarter budget that we did last summer. Um, initially, we had, a bit, had appropriated about a half a million dollars for parks refunds. Um, because of the limitations on travel, we, there were lots of individuals who had to cancel their reservations at state parks. Commissioner Snyder can go into a lot more detail on this if needed, but um, the through conversations with the administration, it was determined that this would be revenue replacement, which was not a allowable use of coronavirus relief funds. So we were unable to use these funds for the parks fund. This will be a, an additional conversation throughout the FY22 and the FY21 budget adjustment process. This is sort of how we make sure that the parks fund is made whole for those cancellations um, that we refunded through the past year. Um, the next appropriation, and it's a little misleading, it was in the, um, in the act related to healthcare and human services, and it was related to sort of public health um, on state lands, but the agency received $3 million to do um, upgrades, if you will, and to put um, signage on lands so that people knew what to do when they visited um, different places, so at wildlife management areas, at the parks. Um, and the Commissioner Snyder can show some great pictures and go into more detail in terms of the projects that the agency was able to accomplish. We worked really hard over the past summer to identify areas where um, expansion and improvement to, access to different um, properties would improve access for the public um, and worked really hard to get those dollars on the ground to um, make those improvements so that both this current year, we could ensure that people could access those lands, but to also make sure that in the future that the infrastructure is set up to kind of manage increased utilization. Um, the next allocation of resources um, was more in the universe of grants to businesses. So as part of, to try to help um, the economy through the pandemic, Forest and Parks was allocated $1.5 million for 
outdoor recreation businesses. We worked closely with um, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to get those dollars on the ground. We were able to allocate all but about $20,000 to outdoor recreation businesses. Over the summer, that $19,000 was reallocated into the larger pool of grants to businesses through the Agency of Commerce and Community Development per statute at the end of last summer. Additionally, um, the Department of Environmental Conservation and working with Commerce and Community Development on the housing front, I'm sure you're aware and Commissioner Walk would be happy to come in and talk in further detail about the red tag program, but there were um, lots of individuals across the state who through the red tag program had their fuel tanks red tagged and they weren't able to have fuel delivered as we entered into the winter working with ACCD we were able to get $300,000 out to Vermonters to have their tanks replaced so that they could have heating this winter um, and could stay in their homes. The next allocation was the forest economy stabilization grants. These are similar to the outdoor recreation grants but were targeted specifically towards um, businesses that are in the forest economy. We were able to push out of the $5 million, we were able to allocate 3.7 million. Um, and the remainder went back to ACCD on September 15th to go into their grant program. I'll let Commissioner Snyder speak in more detail to the impacts on the forest economy and how um, these funds were utilized. And finally, um, through the joint fiscal committee process, which the Joint Fiscal Committee had the ability to allocate funds to agencies and departments as they saw it fit throughout the, um, while the legislature wasn't in session, we received some additional um, funds to kind of help modernize some of the processes at the agency. Um, in thinking through our need to interact with the public, but not wanting to have, you know, pieces of paper needing to shuffle back both, the, all three departments worked to try to digitize some of the resources that we use with the public. So FPR has been working hard to digitize a lot of the maps used for the current use program and a lot of those documents so that they didn't, so that it was easier for individuals to access them digitally. Additionally, the Department of Environmental Conservation has been working on um, a permit navigator. Um, and again, I'm sure Commissioner Walk would love to come talk to you further about that, but it is sort of an online tool that helps individuals figure out what permits they need depending on the type of um, project they're undertaking. Um, so in all told, um, I don't know why I said 12 million at the beginning, $14 million were allocated to the agency. Um, the majority of which went to the um, Department of Forest Parks and Recreation with a little bit to Fish and Wildlife and DEC. Um, to help do great things during a really hard time. So I don't know if there are any specific questions on that. Um, so it was 14 million allocated and then 10.6 spent? Yes. Okay. And um, can I, if you don't mind, I would correct one statement so people are clear. Sure. The Joint Fiscal Committee didn't get to allocate all the Joint Fiscal Committee got to do was approve the plan that was presented by the fifth floor. So we either got to um, accept or reject the plan that the fifth floor. Now in that, they, the administration made proposals and we did um, negotiate on some of those, but um, the plan was really an administration plan that we approved. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Um, any committee questions on any, we, it sounds like we'll double back and hear more about the details. Um, that last one on regulatory proceedings and permitting, uh, is that address the long sought sort of uh, one-stop shopping thinking, you know, like check in and, and as efficiently as possible find out all the permits that your project would entail start to finish? Yes, the, the goal, it's starting to get us there. So yeah. I think Commissioner Watt can speak more to specifically where we're at at this point, um, but they've been working hard to kind of, to get that one-stop shop stood up. Great, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, any committee questions for 
Ms. Byrne, right? Can um, um, I, Senator Westman. One, um, so since we get this, and I want um, people to be able to understand what has happened, but going forward, have you assessed the new federal bill and what um, we, what freedom we might have, what was sent directly to you? What do you know about the new federal bill and what decisions um, the legislature will have to make that we might want to weigh in on? Sure, so we, the new bill, I believe extended the deadlines for spending. I know the administration is working on a plan um, holistically in terms of what resources will be needed across state government, what money is left for the rest of the year and how that will be deployed. So there hasn't been any funding specifically allocated to ANR through the last bill. Um, I do anticipate that there will probably be additional money at some point coming out of Washington. Um, this is totally Emily Byrne speculation, but at that point we'll have to reassess um, what will come to the agency. So let, 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 let so are you talking about what hasn't been allocated and because of the new rules, we can go into the next year, what might be reallocated to you? Or are you talking about the new federal bill that passed and the um, um, what was in that bill that specifically is handed out? Um, it was there money for um, um, natural resources or natural resources type things in the bill that was passed in Congress and um, signed by the president in late December. Sure. So I, I was speaking more to the former, the sort of changes to the CARES Act piece. In terms of there is no money coming directly to natural resources or to the agency of natural resources from the new bill. Um, so yeah, at this point, there isn't anything. And, and nothing to any of the functions that we might be interested in. Not specifically, no. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. And of the um, expenses, so the roughly um, 10 million that you needed to get through the pandemic to date, um, do you have a sense of what portion of those expenses will be ongoing um, and what kind of needs, special needs that you're anticipating for, for uh, 22 at this point? Sure, so most of the expenses were one-time in nature. So the business grants were one-time, the um, improvements to public lands were one-time. In, in terms of knowing whether or not from a public health perspective, the agency will need additional funds um, for sanitization, I think likely um, this summer, but we you know, have to see how sort of the next six months play out. And sure. we'll be thinking about that in our budget and in the sort of processes next spring. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so do you, <laughs> In terms of the budget you're proposing, are you uh, are you basically including anticipated ongoing expenses like PPE, extra cleaning costs, et cetera, that sort of routine uh, extraordinary expense, if you can call it that? Sure. So I don't want to get out in front of the governor's budget address next yeah. Thursday, I believe. So I think stay tuned and... Um, we can provide more information once the governor's budget has been officially presented to the legislature on that, on those okay. topics. Sure, great. Um, any uh, other committee questions for Ms. Byrne? All right, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to turn it to uh, Commissioner Snyder. Good morning, Commissioner Snyder. Good morning, Mr. Chair, thanks. Um, um, you want to direct me in a particular way? Well, I think in terms of since uh, your operating area was the largest user of, of um, CARES money, and uh, if you could just kind of walk us through so we'll better understand what was going on out in the field, sure. and then really where our task as a committee at the moment is 
twofold. One is just to check in and see how the pandemic ended up affecting your area for the last year. And then uh, what needs will you have going forward? And I don't know to what degree might those be financial or programmatic changes. Um, okay. Great. Well, I'm happy to do that. I'm prepared to do so. And um, so for the record, uh, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation, happy to be with you here this morning. Happy New Year. Uh, best for an excellent biennium. I look forward to working with you. Um, I can, uh, I'm prepared to show a few slides that will give a, in, a sort of an illustration of how we approach the CARES Act funding at FPR. Um, in a few different ways. Emily's touched on them broadly. And, um, and then I, maybe I'd suggest I start with that by sharing my screen if I can. And then uh, I can circle back after that to kind of talk about the, we made some changes already because of the pandemic, temp, pandemic in our you know, policies, programs, uh, uh, some procedures, uh, and we have some thoughts I can share with uh, the going forward. Um, that's all good. Great. Sounds good. I'll, uh, Thank you. Attempt to uh, share my screen uh, to walk you through a few slides. And uh, fortunately, if this goes sideways because of technological limitations, Caroline Zeilinger, who you may see on your screen, she's the executive assistant to the commissioner, and she is uh, here as my backup, and we'll share her screen if we need it. So thank you, Caroline, in advance. Uh, and here I go. Are you all seeing my screen yet? No. There we go. Success. Awesome. And let me go into presentation mode. Okay. Is this really happening? Wonderful. So uh, if I can advance the screen. So as Emily said, broadly speaking at, at FPR, uh, we had these Corona relief funding allocations across several programs. One was uh, I'd start actually on uh, Act 109, the sanitization for state parks. That was, I think, the original million dollars that was used early on. As we uh, think back to the very early times in the pandemic in March and April, that's a time when we would normally be preparing for the operating season in Vermont state parks, uh, which is a significant undertaking uh, for everything from staffing and supplies to gearing up wastewater and drinking water systems that have been overwintered, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's a significant undertaking. Uh, and we had to contemplate how to do all of that in a COVID with VD, uh, VDH and um, CDC guidance on uh, health standards and precautions. So it wasn't at all clear that we'd even be able to operate state parks last year, but uh, we did. We opened late uh, and uh, we deployed a million dollars of CARES Act funding for PPEs for our staff, as Emily was stated well, that is about protecting our staff, protecting our guests and the resources. Uh, so that was significant. And a big chunk of that, frankly, went to portalettes uh, because we weren't able to open our bath facilities. Uh, they weren't ready at that time when we made the parks open to folks, even though they weren't operating. Um, and there was, a, as you, I think you've all known, heard by now, a significant uptick in recreational demand and use. Um, and so we met that through PPE, particularly with the portalettes was a big piece of that. Um, the other, uh, so I just wanted to highlight that because the parks thing is kind of different and I circle back to that with needs and thinking for the future um, as we get to that. Um, so uh, the, the, real, the, the next one was that we had about $3 million to the agency that we more or less split with Fish and Wildlife for use in kind of infrastructure projects on, on public lands, on forests, state forests, state parks, and wildlife management areas. Um, because we had had that original chunk for state parks, Fish and Wildlife got a little bit more of this piece. Uh, it's about half, but, uh, and, and we also included in ours $120,000 uh, CRF pass through to VYCC for their uh, youth training crews to, to work with us as they commonly do on some state parks projects. Um, but we, otherwise we, we, uh, we, the rest went to one-time contractors for these very specific projects that were in three basic categories. The bulk of the 36 projects on FPR lands uh, were these 24 to address heavy use impacts. And they were significant of people getting out and there was over, overwhelming the parking areas and there was damage and there was just, just growing pains from all of that use, particularly when we weren't open. Uh, and, uh, and managed and operating. 
Um, we also did several projects to promote, as we say here, low visitor density to help people spread out. Uh, we had a lot of pinch points and in these common uh, popular recreating sites. So we made some tweaks there. Uh, and then we made some modifications to promote safe work conditions, all of which I'll show examples of. Uh, and by the way, I want to note, you know, Fish and Wildlife did a ton of this work as well on WMAs and fishing accesses. And I know Commissioner Porter is prepared to speak to their specifics if, you, if you'd like. I just wanted to make sure you knew about that. This is not the totality on state lands. Um, so we did seven existing parking areas that were we expanded to accommodate parking pressure. This is getting people out of little wetlands on the side or parking in the woods or blocking neighbors driveways. Um, which is a, an ongoing problem and it was exacerbated by um, exceptional use during the pandemic. Uh, we did seven different state forest road pro projects to improve them, providing better access to state lands for recreation, for emergency access, for forest management access, um, and to upgrade water quality protections, uh, aquatic habitat protections, et cetera. So uh, a great opportunity to do the things that we like to do anyway, but in a okay. COVID context with a little bit of extra muscle. Sure, um, can I ask also, a question there? Sure, please. Um, did your list happen to include Huntington and uh, Camel's Hump? Yes, I have a couple shots I will show you there. Uh, Great. Uh, indeed. Uh, so, and then improvements on four recreational trails, including two of these big multi-use rail trails, the Cross Vermont Trail through Gotten State Forest and the West River Trail, which is in Jamaica State Park. Um, and then we did uh, a bunch of projects for staffing support at uh, the most popular destinations like Lake Willoughby, Mount Philo, which were really overrun. Uh, so we put people out to help guide folks, to give best uh, guidance on, on COVID precautions, to interpret the natural world, to make recommendations on how to spread out or maybe alternative locations to go to. Um, sorry, I'm moving along here. So here's a parking expansion example. Uh, this is actually in Camel's Hump State Park in the Dowsville uh, area, uh, providing new access uh, with space for people to, to, uh, so to get out, um, but to do so in a safe way. Uh, trail improvements at Mount Philo, the summit area, our first state park in a couple of years, it'll be its 100th anniversary of the state park system. This was again, the first state park and it's among the most loved, it's in the most populous county and it is completely overrun. Uh, so we are investing heavily there. You'll see um, the trail project here, the stone stairs. There's hundreds of stone steps that have been installed uh, by a local contractor. Uh, this uh, also uh, a significant portion of this is ADA compliant uh, installation, which we do a lot of in state parks and we're really proud of wherever we can to make our access uh, accessible for all. Um, and uh, here's an example of that using CRF funding to do that kind of work uh, at the Mount Philo. Um, and again, anyway, um, trying was, to reduce. Um, sorry to interrupt. I was at Mount Philo twice, two or three times actually in the last six months. And uh, it's a lot of beautiful work and there are a lot of people appreciating it. It's really nice to hear. Yeah, we've been, we've been picking up on that. Um, um, I'm not surprised, but I always like hearing it. So thank you, Senator. Yeah. Uh, again, promoting lower uh, user density, uh, eight projects with uh, the parking areas, a uh, couple of remote camping sites, and we did a lot of communications. We worked with the volunteer driven member, uh, uh, nonprofit trail groups throughout the state, our conservation partners. It was really quite something last spring as we all put our heads together, frankly, Whereas I was communicating with other commissioners and parks directors around the country, colleagues around the country who were contemplating closing their public lands in the early weeks and months of the pandemic, we made an, an, a conscientious decision to keep ours open, to make ours open and encourage people to get out, um, but to do so in a safe way. So we put our heads together and made uh, a lot of guidance, uh, infographics, uh, we did webinars, we uh, gave this sort of encouraged people to do it, but to do it well. And then part of that was to install kiosks and better information for how to do this and alternative locations, et cetera, at many of our uh, trailheads. So an example here, in State Forest, uh, this is a remote shelter that was in disrepair and not usable. Uh, we installed a new uh, composting uh, privy, uh, 
refurbished the remote shelter because there was an awful lot of um, use of, say, the long trail, even though it, at times it was closed. And uh, so, again, trying to just disperse people and provide opportunities for them to get out, uh, enjoy the out of doors, but do so in a safe way that was spread out. Uh, and a significant amount of work was also dedicated to uh, considering how we work and how our partners work and volunteers. Um, so uh, this was about enabling safe sharing of equipment. Emily touched on this as well, but three projects throughout the state for tool caches uh, so that folks didn't have to, you know, be transferring tools back and forth, personal safety devices and PPE. PPE. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll finish with... Uh, Back to the million, that was all the state lands money, 1.4 million. This is the million dollars in sanitization. Uh, and as Emily correctly said, also sanita sanitation, uh, which is the removal of the wastes, uh, which were significant. So everything from PPE, a variety of PPEs shown here, personal protective equipment, um, retrofitting our restrooms to be more COVID intelligent. Uh, I mentioned the high number of uh, portalettes and cleaning that went along with that. It's extremely expensive installing air filters in our contact stations, um, changing the way we dealt with trash, uh, and again, thinking about our tools and how they get shared. And um, I can't say enough about, frankly, our staff throughout all of this. Before I move to the grant programs, parks, staff, management, seasonals, think about a team of almost 400 seasonal employees taking on a global pandemic and visitors from all over the world who either did or were on a spectrum of understanding or cooperation with regard to travel restrictions and COVID safety precautions. These people did an amazing job and we had a great year, although because we had to operate a shortened season with limited uh, capacity, we didn't open shut um, cabins or cottages. They were too difficult to figure out a way to be helpful. We only uh, reserved at 70% occupancy, 75% occupancy. So we had a diminished season, but despite that, we had a, a, a pretty strong showing from Vermonters in overnight use and a 20% increase in out-of-state visitation for day use. Um, all, it just seemed to be, it was stressful. It was challenging. We likely will see, unlike usually where we see return, uh, astronomical levels of rehire among seasonals, we're expecting a uh, reduction because it was just brutal on these folks. But they pulled it off. We should all be thankful and grateful, uh, providing that outdoor experience. Uh, and we got a lot of comments from people who are very grateful for, for our doing so. So I want a big shout out to the parks folks. We're really proud of this and we're gearing up for a new year to try to do it even better. Um, and and uh, and then there's the the state land staff, our foresters, et cetera, who implemented all these contracts in short order. It's amazing they got it all done by December 30th, um, and we're already seeing response from the public, increased access, um, fewer conflicts. Um, so we're really grateful and uh, for the allocations of the funding. Thank you. But I hope we can all be appreciative of these professionals who dedicate themselves and put themselves at risk, frankly, to get all this done. Yeah. Quickly, I'll just cover, Emily touched on, we had... Um, Commissioner, just a quick question. Of course. Uh, sure. So how about the health of your staff? How did, you know, that was a riskier than normal time to be working. How did that, how did <laughs> yeah. that work out for everyone? I very much appreciate your awareness and sensitivity. Thanks for asking. Um, very pleased to say we made it through. You know, we had a couple scares. We had some staff who had exposure. Um, we had We did quarantining. Um, by the way, we also, we had to invest in some uh, modifications to staff housing, um, and that was really challenging. So we got, the, the, the short answer is I'm very happy to say, gratefully, we, we didn't have any health, um, any infections, but we did have some scares um, and, uh, and, and had to make some adjustments uh, and pull people offline for, for, for quarantining, et cetera, to be safe, but uh, we made it through. Thank you. Great. Glad to hear that. Thank you. You bet. Um, we had uh, $5 million allocated for, uh, to create the forest economy stabilization grants, um, working with ACCD, with our friends and colleagues at VEDA, Vermont Economic Development Authority, uh, that, that uh, helped us stand up this program uh, and then get uh, just under 5 million uh, uh, or under 4 million out the door with $50,000 went to VEDA for their cost, cost per the legislation, the rest went back to ACCD, which they reinvested in other businesses. So of the 5 million, we deployed just under 4 million for forest economy businesses pretty much throughout the state. Um, and uh, 
Then similarly, we had a $1.5 million allocation for outdoor recreation related businesses. Um, and similarly, we stood up a, a program, uh, worked with partners at VOBA, the Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance, and the Vermont Trails and Greenways Council volunteers who helped screen and you know, kind of create the thresholds and definitions and screen the projects. And um, also managed to get the, the money out the door to some very grateful businesses um, uh, in the outdoor sector as well. Sure. So, uh, Commissioner, can you say something about um, the forestry and outdoor rec grants? Uh, uh, what was the criteria for use for awards? Uh, I mean, was this really basically like income replacement or did they have to be undertaking sort of a specific project and you were underwriting costs for it? Yeah, and that's those are perfectly good questions. I'm sorry that I'm it's not on the top of my mind. I might ask Emily if you Emily played a superhero role throughout all of this uh, in the business office. So Emily, can you bail me out here and provide the senator with the explanation there, uh, the basic thresholds and definitions? Sure. Can you repeat the question one more time? And I may have to think for a minute because it was. It happened sure. very quickly and fast, and it was done by about September. So. Exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, and if you need to look into it and get back to us, that's totally fine. I just was trying to understand the nature of the grants. So, for instance, were they basically uh, replacing lost income, or, and so they were, you know, income supplements, or were there projects that the businesses were undertaking and you were underwriting the costs for them? Sure. So it was specifically for revenue loss. Okay. Um, so when we did the approved applications, it was based on what your prior over over a specific time period, what your prior year revenue was compared to what your revenue was through those same months of 2020. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, in addition, we did have this, uh, as was mentioned, referred to as the JFO money for uh, which uh, was really significant in uh, helping us digitize the current use records. Uh, Two million acres, 16,000 parcels around the state um, with a lot of paperwork um, and a long history of that, that paperwork where there's management plans and updates, uh, conformance reports, correspondence, all of which has real implications, legal and otherwise, if you, if you don't follow, right? So we couldn't access these files, nor could uh, Vermonters. So this was a problem as we went to remote, in other words. So this is this project is about digitizing records um, safely, so um, records so we can access them safely and make them available in a remote context, which has worked well. We're out of about 120 file boxes, we're about 50 boxes through and six counties have been completed. Um, and uh, sorry to report, Mr. Chair, Addison County's not quite done yet, but uh, <laughs> we're on it. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, and um, so this is, um, you know, it's, it's not fun. It's not all that snazzy, but it's important and it's really helpful. And it's also for the future to help us move to be more depth, depth, deft and, uh, in our communications and work with constituents and will allow us to be more so in future issues like this or any kind of an emergency. So that's been... Uh, Tough work, well done, and with good impact. Uh, so Did that free up time for um, foresters? I'm sorry, Senator Westman, what was that? Will that free up any time for foresters? Well, that's a, a great point. That's part of the bigger picture here is, uh, and it's part of a longer term ongoing effort to move to an electronic administration and current use, both at property valuation and review attacks and with us. We've all been investing in that. So yes, I think it will help that's the idea is to just be more quick and uh, we'll definitely save time. I, you know, as you know, I was a county forester and it was an off brutal amount of time just on paperwork um, that can be a lot faster in a digital mode. So I, I hope it will contribute to efficiencies there as well. I'll stop screen sharing um, and uh, take further questions there or I can, we can talk a little bit more about um, you know, the future, uh, other, you know, I want to say we did make other adjustments. Clearly parks was a lot of adjusting. Similarly, in say the current use program, we made some policy tweaks to allow folks who had a management plan update that was legally due on April 1st. We found a way to make some extensions there um, to give some flexibility to Vermonters who were dealing with the pandemic. 
Uh, same for the fall enrollments. Uh, we just tweaked our administration and our ability uh, and how we worked with contractors, how we worked with constituents, with volunteers. So there was an, a, lot of, a lot of adjustments throughout, uh, beginning with just us, us as, as, as professionals and as staff adjusting to a work from home when these are largely field-based people um, like caged animals in the spring who just can't wait, wait to get out to do their work <laughs> on the public lands. And we told them, you can't, it's an emergency and you have to stay home. So we had to figure out a way, which included like county foresters uploading dozens of webinars and videos from their own home woodlots to continue sharing good information with Vermonters, moving to webinars. We just, they just changed and, and adapted. And again, I couldn't be more proud because they're all about delivering service to Vermonters. Uh, and found a way in creative, intelligent, and impactful, helpful, and safe ways. So a lot of tweaks. I'm happy to talk about various ones, but um, what's of interest to you, if, and especially about needs for the future, I'm interested in that. I appreciate you asked that. Senator Gray, sure. where would you like me to go from here? Yeah, I think, well, let me see. Senator McCormick has a question. And dear, there we go. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to repeat what I, I had said to you back in the summer about what a wonderful time I, uh, my son and I had at Wilgus State Park in, uh, in Escutney. Uh, we were canoeing on, uh, I guess we're actually in New Hampshire canoeing, but then we put in in Vermont. Uh, how are you doing, not with parks, but with multi-use public lands? Do you do, I'm, I'm thinking specifically about Shattagy, which is, um, you know, it's logged. There are also recreational vehicles on it. And there are a lot of people like the Appalachian Trail, for example, comes right through it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's multi-use, which public lands are supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but some of those uses conflict with others. How, how are you handling that? It's uh, as ever. Uh, we, that's a fact of our world is, uh, as you indicate, Senator, uh, all of these public lands are uh, basically multi-use. We have certain uses that tend to be kind of singular, uh, and exclude other uses. Think maple sugaring with tubing and all, um, some of our trail systems can be dense and, you know, but, but, and, and it not, doesn't work that you just can't have, we've all accepted that you can't have every use on every acre all the time. So our folks have been managing that basically forever, conflicts of use and sort of zoning of use. And we just continued with that approach, basically encouraging people to play, play nicely uh, and to give good guidance and to make it clear where certain things are best happening in others. That said, there's always gonna be user conflicts and tensions of, of one sort or another. Um, where forest management say and recreation go, we've, I think we should all be proud. We've come a long way in just kind of understanding how to do that. Um, and we make, sometimes we have to temporarily close a ski trail or a snow machine trail for active management. But as a forester, I've men, run many of those projects and it's amazing. I would actually all, usually find a way to have say weekend use or some limited use for the snow machines during the project. We just work it out in short. Um, particularly yeah. on state lands and public lands. We try to help folks manage those challenges on private lands as well. I think we're doing fine. I think folks have actually responded. Oh, I, Usually, I want you to know you do have at least one loud voice in Windsor County defending you when you're accused of taking away people's God-given constitutional uh, jet ski, not jet ski rights, their ATV rights. Right. So. Yes, and that's ongoing. You know, as you all, I think, know that ATVs are, are prohibited on agency lands uh, by rule. And, uh, and there's, that's just, that's the way it is. It's ongoing. I mean, they're, they're prohibited for recreational use. They are allowed for emergency access and for management use, I should be clear. But thank you, Senator. And we got them up in, you got them up in Shattuckie. Yes. On the logging roads. Understood. That's legal, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, any other you, questions for the commissioner on the stuff we've already looked at? Uh, great. Well, so the other side of the coin for this committee is, okay, looking forward into the next fiscal year and to the calendar year we just entered. Uh, are there things that the, you can make the committee aware of in terms of ongoing pressures you're facing or, you know, what's the future look like for the department? and what should we be aware of as a committee? Um, 
Sure. So we've all learned a lot during this time. I think we're still learning uh, and trying to project that forward. So again, it's we're thinking is I think the parks piece I would just set aside as as a whole conversation unto itself. This is a complex little business enterprise operating within state government uh, with many many challenges in a in a pandemic, uh, and so. Um, I'll set that aside. There's a lot there that we have to think about and we are thinking about for the coming season and how to adjust and then thinking about funding for the future, et cetera. Um, the rest is how, you know, the, the, the state lands, I think we've demonstrated through the, the CRF funds and the infrastructure projects, there's plenty of work to do and we could do more of that kind of work. And I think thinking about it's showing us that small investments in public infrastructure on public lands by putting family contractors to work around the state uh, shows great promise, I would say, for, you know, short term economic recovery as we emerge from the pandemic by public works projects on public lands that, again, put local contractors to work and make long term investments in recreational access, forest health, invasive species control. Um, did I mention recreational access, uh, etc. There's many opportunities for us to do more of what we do and to take better care of what we take care of, uh, all towards a rebuilding economy, uh, health of our citizenry, connectedness to the land. We see great benefits there. So I think there's a lot of opportunity that we've seen that we can continue to do on state lands. I think we also are realizing that the new normal for um, remote working um, and, and digital work, there's just more of that we have to adjust to. I think I said, we're proud of how we've adjusted. But I think we need to think more, per, you know, more long term about how to kind of plan for interactions with constituents and services to Vermonters, infrastructure, et cetera, all in kind of a COVID smart way, because you know, there's some thought that maybe this isn't the last time we have to go through this. So I think those sure. are big picture areas of where there's opportunity. Um, you know, I've got lots of suggestions for how, to, you know, that 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 estimates of funding that would be needed and uh, how to do so. And as Emily, you know, following Emily's lead, I, I, I don't wanna get ahead of the governor's <coughs> budget, um, uh, submission just yet. So I'll, I'll leave those alone. But uh, so I think, you know, it's everything, everything from the real practical and obvious, like continuing PPE, you asked about it, Senator Bray at the beginning, are we yeah. planning for that? Uh, all the way through modifications to how we work, um, digitization continuing, um, and, and providing services in a new way. Um, we had to cancel a lot of things uh, and we made up some of that. Um, yeah, this is about trainings for professionals uh, and for landowners. Uh, so again, there's just this enormous range of items that we have to adjust to and I'm eager to think about how to do those differently in the future. Um, Does your think, department run game of logging, for instance, or is that somebody else? We we don't. That's its own thing. We help sponsor and we organize and we support the trainings. Uh, and, and it's very important. This is about professionalism and safety training in um, of, of chainsaw use. Uh, we require it of our any staff who are going to operate a, a chainsaw. Uh, we require it of contractors. It's, it's really great stuff. It's part of the workers' compensation uh, reform that we've been doing for the logging sector. We don't actually put on the trainings, but we partner with those who do and often support those trainings. Um, you know, it, the infrastructure investment side of things, you're making me appreciate and then seeing those pictures at Philo. Uh, one of the things that struck me when I was there was this was one of the first times I saw construction that reminded me of WPA projects well, in terms of the in terms of the permanence and sort of uh, I'll say like artisanship of it you know like the stonework that was you know I said oh this is not just regular trail work this is this is a permanent uh, handsome improvement to the facility I'm glad you noticed. I agree. Thank you. And I, you know, this is something as we've gone through the summer and fall, I've just been thinking others have heard me say it, like, and you referenced the, the WPA, though, this alphabet soup of uh, depression era New Deal programs, uh, the CCC. I mean, that is the, the core, the basis, the founding of this Vermont State Park system. It was mostly built during the, the CCC era. Um, I just think it's exciting to think that we have a chance now to kind of 
we could look to a, a modern version of that workforce training. Um, again, putting people to work, training others, um, using Vermont local supplies, uh, supporting Vermont businesses and having these lasting, as you say, um, projects that continue to give back and do good and provide for economic benefit and health benefits and environmental benefits for the long term. It just seems like we should be thinking hard about this. There's re real opportunity here, uh, particularly for a post-pandemic kind of recovery, as I see it. Right. Um, well, so two things. One is in, uh, in conversations amongst you and your colleagues here and around the country, with the change of administration, is do you have a sense that there is uh, a federal interest in that kind of uh, state level investment? Um, I do uh, interest. I, I go. I think there really is. I've had this conversation and versions of it with colleagues around the state, uh, around the country, uh, and am in touch. And uh, and uh, you know, early I floated this, and a group of uh, state recreation directors got pretty excited about it. Um, talking with federal delegations, I, you know, whether they're, I think there's interest and, uh, and I think we're going to see some, I actually do think we're going to see some, uh, some response to that interest. I'm, maybe I'm just being really hopeful, but um, I'm not the only one singing the song. It's a pretty good song to sing. And I think people are hearing it. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is, um, I don't want to, can you speak a little bit about the uh, you know, we have an economy to rebuild, right? And there are people still unemployed. Um, so can you talk a little bit? Of, I don't know that most people think of the forest parks and recreation sector as an area for economic development, other than maybe the higher profile things like, um, you know, the growth in mountain biking or something like that. Yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, I'm extremely sanguine and excited about this because I think it, it, all signs indicate, and in Vermont, we have a special um, opportunity. So um, it's, I, I'm sorry, I distracted, lost my train of thought. I, I think, Senator, would you just repeat quickly? I'm sorry. Well, I'm just wondering, just, there's, we've, uh, we have some work to do to sort out the trails regulation piece that will be helpful to those businesses but can you talk a little bit about where there are opportunities with um, investment that will help grow jobs particularly you know durable jobs that pay a, a reasonable wage that kind of thing you know yeah. the, the kind of jobs we're looking for Exactly. Um, so, you know, this is the premise of the VOREC initiative, the, uh, the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, which is to bring disparate parties uh, across the sector, nonprofits, for-profits, uh, in, the, in the outdoor business world, and the conservation community to create an intentional kind of approach to advising all of us on the opportunities for leveraging, as we call it, recreational assets, our, our wonderful environment, our built assets of infrastructure, trailheads, boat accesses, ski trails, and our cultural assets of a culture of outdoor life um, to leverage those significant assets for a greater economic outcome. That's the Volrec premise. Um, and indeed, you say, as you say, it's, it's, it's unheralded, but it's significant. So it's Vermont ranks third or fourth in the entire country in percent of GDP from outdoor recreation. It's a massive employer and a major uh, part of, uh, again, it's, you know, it's it, relative to other states, we have, a, it's an outsized role in our GDP. The forest economy is $1.5 billion uh, annually in, in economic activity. So combined, these are a significant part of Vermont's economy, and they support other bedrock components of our economy, tourism uh, in particular. So, and, and in fact, as I like to think of it, it's a unique competitive advantage we have because investing in outdoor business, uh, and in the nonprofits that kind of are the backbone that have created this uh, and supporting Vermont landowners, mostly private landowners who provide this, th that has major uh, payoff um, in the, you know, kind of holds it all together. Uh, and uh, I think that's what folks are recognizing. And my point is we have the assets, we have the culture and it's unspoiled to a great degree. We have a human scale where we can talk to each other. And when I work with other state recreation directors around the country, their jaws drop. When I tell them we're within a day's drive of 80 million people, um, you know, we're not the Rockies, 
we're never going to compete with the Rockies, but they're pretty jealous of the culture and the opportunity for economic power through recreation that we have ongoing here in Vermont. And we should seize that opportunity. There's a lot here. And that's, that's what really where we're, we're headed. And it's, I'm excited because frankly, I think that the last piece is that it's purple, frankly, it's not red or blue. It's uh, multipartisan. It's everyone can get behind it. And here's the big finish. It's not inconsistent with, it's totally consistent with and augments our natural and working landscapes. It's not like either or, it's not like you have to choose. This is win, 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 and this is where we should be investing. Okay. Um, and can you say one little bit about uh, susceptibility to disruption due to a pandemic? You know, I mean, I think that was one of the things we've come to appreciate in the last nine months is things that we took for granted that now we realize they can be disrupted when you have a pandemic underway. So I, I know we're all right. we're not facing another thing like COVID-19 in the near future, but uh, how do you look at growing that industry and with a sensitivity towards disruption? We're learning those lessons now through all sectors, you know, and by the way, I want to make it clear that as we invest and grow the sector, it has to be, it's all predicated on environmental quality. That's, you don't, you don't want to, that's the goose that lays the golden egg here. So I just want to start with that. Like everybody understand that's a basic fundamental premise as we invest, but the interruptions and the disruptions, that's what this has been about. The recreation side, fortunately we have access and we've made it available. That's not been interrupted. Similarly, we're hearing from uh, business partners uh, in, say, the retail and the manufacturers of outdoor gear. They're out of paddles. They're out of kayaks. They're out of boats. They're out of bikes. Like, you can't get them. We have demand and users, new users. How wonderful is that? Um, and so the, but the disruption in the supply chain that goes well beyond Vermont's borders and our policies is, is really something we have to think about. And that's those kind of the next level, that meta level of disruption is something I think we're not well suited for. Same in the forest economy. When we started running out of toilet paper and, uh, and medical supplies that need paper packaging and wood products, heating hospitals and schools, the supply chain was disrupted. We have to think more broadly and comprehensively about how to put systems in place that are robust against such uh, interruptions. So on the sort of local scale, in the recreation side, and to some extent in the forest side, we didn't have interruptions. We deemed uh, forestry as an essential. Um, and so folks were able to work, but maybe they couldn't get the parts for the machinery or the market into which they would sell was closed. So it's those connections and the secondary uh, components that I think are really vexing and hard to plan for and to think about. We have opportunities to live through it, but we don't control everything, if that makes sense. Sure, absolutely. Okay, well, this has definitely been a year of a lot of learning and a lot of ways for, for all of us. Um, any other committee questions for Commissioner Snyder right now? All right, um, so we are uh, trying this year not to just be glued to our chairs uh, uh, nonstop. So we're gonna pause for 10 minutes, give people a chance to stand up, stretch, move, and then we'll sit down and resume the meeting. So Senator, are you get healthy for 10 minutes and we'll see you shortly. I don't know next, if uh, who on the ANR side is going to continue after the break. We will pick up with uh, 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 Mr. Barsati. So Senator, I'm sorry, just to be clear, are you finished with us? Would you like us to stick around or not? Um, it's, thank you for the question. Uh, no, we're, I mean, we're going to move yeah. on to the other witnesses for the morning. So if, uh, I know you all, Did you hear him? I know you all He's have um, things to do. So if you want to, um, take off, we'll say thanks very much. And we look forward to working with you again for another session in Biennium. Okay, great. Thank you all. Appreciate it. We look forward to it. Any, you know how to reach us anytime. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.
Um, hello, Jude. Um, hi, Senator Hi. Bray. Yes. Bob Fisher. Uh, I believe Mar Mike Barsati, the president, is not going to speak. Uh, is that uh, correct? Actually, Bob, I'm just going to say some brief words at the beginning. But yeah, the okay. main speakers will be Bob and, and Joe Duncan. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. And thanks for being with me. Here goes my timer going off. All right. It's something new for us to take a short break so we're not sitting for <laughs> four Zoom meetings in a row and uh, rusting in place. Uh, so we are uh, back live, uh, Senate Natural Resources and Energy, uh, second hour for the, uh, on Wednesday, January 13th. Um, and as part of our review of how things are going out there in the world uh, in terms of what the impacts of the pandemic have been, we wanted to check in on public water supplies. And so we have uh, three guests with us now. And I think uh, I'll go on the order on our agenda, starting with uh, Mr. Barsati. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Bray. Thank you uh, very we much. We can't quite hear you yet. Mm. Uh, yes, we can. Uh, now, again. now we Hi, can. Senator Bray. Okay. Um, not yet. Not yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes, we, we can, can hear see you talking, but I'm not hearing any. Is everyone else, anyone else yeah. hearing something? Yes. Okay. So let's go. Okay. Uh, well, again, thank you very much, Senator Bray. Greatly appreciated. I'm Mike Barsotti. I am the current president of Green Mountain Water Environment Association, uh, and I'm also a direct director at Champlain Water District. Um, so one of the things we really appreciate is the fact that the uh, committee has invited uh, various members of Green Mountain Water Environment Association to testify and provide information. We really hope that what comes out of this is that uh, you realize what a good resource Green Mountain Water Environment Association is in the members of Green Mountain Water Environment Association are to provide information to the committee. Um, we have uh, on the agenda, and actually on tomorrow's agenda, we have uh, Bob Fisher, Joe Duncan, and Tom DiPietro, all uh, very active members of the Green Mount Water Environment Association. When they talk on the agenda, I'm sure they'll, they'll introduce themselves. But to just let you know that uh, they've all been very, very actively involved. And Bob is the, uh, is the uh, committee chair of our, our Government Affairs Committee. Uh, and Joe, is, Joe Duncan is also on the Government Affairs Committee. So some very uh, knowledgeable, um, very involved people who are gonna to speak to the committee today. Uh, I did just wanna give a, a, an introduction. Uh, and so at that point, I'll turn it back to Senator Bray. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thanks very much. You know, one of the things that um, when we first dipped into all this work last spring, when the pandemic first came online was, that we were checking in with folks like you and the wastewater treatment facility operators, solid waste, the whole solid waste system, um, utility folks. Uh, and these are the kinds of services that people all too easily take for granted. Yeah. They just figure they're gonna have lights, water, power, sewer, septic, uh, waste taken away. Um, so uh, I, I just wanna pause and thank you and your members for um, rising to the challenge of the pandemic and figuring out how to way to keep this kind of crucial infrastructure um, operating so well in the background that for most people, they continue to take it for granted, but it was essential that it was there. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, so Mr. Fisher. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you for those words. And yes, we are always here quietly, people generally do not know we're here. Um, so I'm Bob Fisher, the water quality superintendent for the city of South Burlington. I'm also the Green Mountain Water Environment Association Government Affairs Chair and a past president of the association. GIMWE is the Vermont Trade Association of approximately 500 members encompassing water, wastewater, and stormwater operators, consulting engineers, regulators, administrators, and scientists. I'm a biologist. I'm also the vice president for the six New England State Association, NOEO, with over 2,300 members 
And these are all under the umbrella of the National Organization for WEF for Wastewater, which was founded in 1928, and AWWA for Drinking Water, which, found, which was founded in 1881. I'm also a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee on Lake Champlain's future. Um, so the Government Affairs Committee uh, consists of members of uh, GIMWIA, many that you may know, such as Jeff Wenberg, and many people have testified here before. Um, VLCT, Vermont Leagues of City and Towns, Karen Horn's a member, uh, and the Vermont Rural Water Association. We all work very well together, um, including Executive Director Liz Royer, who gave me extensive input on this testimony. Um, we only found out about this yesterday afternoon, so I still got stuff coming in pretty quick here when I sent a call out to the, uh, to the committee. Um, so um, the 94 wastewater systems and hundreds of water systems in the state are protectors of health in the environment and have been affected by this terrible virus in numerous ways. Uh, EPA has recognized that water and wastewater personnel are essential workers who operate and maintain critical public health infrastructure. These are very complicated systems, generally the largest investment for a municipality, and they require licensed operators with years of training. Like many utilities, water and wastewater systems have lost revenue during this pandemic because customers have struggled to pay their bills. However, most water and sewer utilities were initially left out of the Vermont Arrearage Assistance Program, VCAP, which the legislator created in July using CARES Act funds. Some funding did become available in November, but this does not cover the continued needs of many water and wastewater systems. For instance, here in South Burlington, delinquencies uh, average annually approximately 6%. And the most recent numbers I have seen currently have them at 26%. For some of the smaller water systems, just a small increase in delinquencies can cause operating difficulties. Stowe is seeing a 30% reduction in commercial water sewer usage and revenue. Stowe also unfortunately dis disproportionately relies on commercial usage rates. Um, so there's reduced revenue all around. Shelburne has seen an increase in delinquencies and have 10 accounts that have applied for COVID relief but doesn't have the exact numbers in the short time frame. Um, Megan Moore just responded to me from, uh, she is the water, Burlington Water Resources Division Director. She says, sorry that I don't have hard numbers at hand. We definitely experienced an overall decrease in volumetric revenue, primary source of revenue, even with the balancing offset of some increased residential usage, stay at home, and irrigation water due to the dry summer. The decrease, the decrease is driven by the decrease in the commercial sector and institutional, uh, UVM, Champlain, the hospitals. We built a FY21 budget on the premise that we would likely have to dip into our cash reserves. We also pulled a revenue anticipation note that covered delayed collections. We did have to cut way back on spending and some planned capital projects due to knowing we would have a revenue shortfall. The COVID arrearage program was great and, and would love 100% to see it expanded, extended. Um, so VCAP only, or VCAAP only provides a fraction of the money needed to meet revenue deficits of smaller water utilities. In budgeting for next year, many systems are having to reduce staff hours, defer maintenance on critical infrastructure, and postpone necessary construction projects and improvements. Our drinking water and wastewater systems are essential for protection of public health and to maintain their services throughout the pandemic. Most are, uh, systems are not optimistic about the next six-month six period and are planning seeing a larger proportion of unpaid bills and more businesses close in their communities, unfortunately. Water and wastewater systems also continue to be the subject to a shutoff moratorium established by the legislature in March 2020, Act 92. <coughs> Although not shutting off service for people that have recently become unemployed is important, shutoffs are often only the only option for community water systems who struggle to collect payment from habitual delinquent customers. The legislature needs to ensure that all water and wastewater systems and their customers are included in future COVID assistance programs. With decreasing revenues and increasing regulation, many water and wastewater systems are, are having capacity challenges. Any proposed legislation needs to consider the scientific feasibility of testing, unintended consequences of new regulations, and creating a funding mechanism to cover all associated costs. As a society, we cannot afford to continue to stress these entities that are essential to the protection of public health and the environment. The one thing I've learned, and I, which I know you all know on this committee more than anyone else, there's no easy solutions. Things are always gray. Every action can have unintended consequences. For example, these sewerage facilities can generally be modified to address new contaminants, but not without large costs. Septage processing capacity is a major issue in Vermont. Talking with a major septic college yesterday, PMP, they had their largest year ever as many people are staying home. PMP hauled 4.9 million gallons of septage in 2019 and 5.6 million gallons in 2020, their most ever. 55% of Vermonters are in septic tanks. That's the highest proportion by population in the United States. The average is 
although modern mound systems are better than older systems, um, you must take PFAS or microplastics, emerging contaminants. While they can be treated for residents on sewerage systems, where do you think it goes from a septic tank into the ground surrounding the system? Land application. For example, in South Burlington, we average total suspended solids going out of 1.4. A well run, the best systems do 100 times more of that going out, a septic system. Plus 10 to 15% are failing per federal estimates. Phosphorus, the two facilities in South Burlington serving 20,000 South Burlington residents and approximately 2,000 Colchester residents, 22,000 people, discharge as much phosphorus daily as 35 residents on a septic system. It's 22,000. Um, the biosolids produced by the facilities have to go somewhere. Everyone poops 410 pounds a year on average. I'm probably more like a Volkswagen. I have the uh, reference manual here if anyone's interested that we use in the industry. Um, sorry, I didn't submit it for um, documentation. Um, there are increased greenhouse gas emissions and leachate from Coventry from increased trucking, say if the South Burlington's biocells are landfill, not to mention at least $300,000 increase, $300, increase in annual cost for 6,200 connections. There's no easy solutions anywhere. It's gotta go somewhere. Affordability was already an issue, especially for people on fixed incomes. A study by Michigan State University found, funded by the National Science Foundation claims nearly 36% of U.S. households will be unable to afford water in five years if water rates continue rising at projected amounts. There are several ways to calculate it. I'm sure you all know MHI, medium household income, the total amount of bills divided by medium household income of all customers. You know, gets you a number. Anything above 2.5 percent can affect can affect the municipality's ability to borrow funds. Um, the uh, Barry, for instance, is a 2.9, and Johnson's is already a 3.1. This is pre-COVID numbers. That doesn't take into effect that there's some major disparity. There are some very wealthy people. There are some very poor people on fixed incomes. So the 2.5 percent is across the board. Doesn't break it out. There's lots of other COVID problems. Wipes, disposable wipes, wipes claws. Clog pipes, go to the DEC's website, it says that. Disposable wipes are generally not disposable. This has been a huge issue with the industry uh, nationally as, as they've come into play. Um, people put them down the toilet. It's very hard to quantify in Vermont because generally an operator pulls a pump apart, pulls the rags out, that's the industry term, and doesn't pick them apart to see what they are as he's gotta get that pump back in service as fast as they can. Nationally, there've been attempts to ban them like DC did, but the industry is sued and pushed back. The aging work staff, these are very difficult and ex expensive facilities to operate. The average age of an operator is 56 in Vermont. Uh, we've been very lucky with COVID so far. Many people are running uh, split shifts and uh, EPA has a, a designated them as essential uh, operators, as, as, as employees. But as in Vermont, it's each state by state. Uh, frontline health workers are A1, 1A as they should well be. But many other states, uh, operators are 1B, while we are just in the whole age-based population. Your water and wastewater system goes down. The hospital or somewhere loses power. It goes on generator. You lose your water and wastewater system. You know, no one can jump in. These people, it takes for years to run. you got to be a licensed operator. Middlebury, for example, is operating on split shifts, but they're losing 10 hours per day. Building inspections have stopped unless it's an emergency. Stowe is splitting their, their operator shift. Those are many systems. Really, the one thing we discovered in South Burlington with 32 pump stations and two large facilities operated by staff of only seven, that really the only non-essential person here is me. Um, I'm here talking to you. I'm doing paperwork and things. All the rest of them are operating. Uh, the two are chief operators over 35 years experience each. Um, you know, we put out Airport Parkway put out 0 0.04 milligrams of phosphorus last year. The influent was over nine milligrams per liter coming in. That is incredibly below our permit levels. PPP have been difficult to come across. Um, you know, here in South Burlington, we are taking part in the National COVID Sewerage Testing and Tracking Program through the CDC and HHS. As people know that you can be first seen in the uh, wastewater system and this can be used as a tracking method. Vermont Warren, the water and uh, wastewater mutual aid network was revived in March. It had kind of died out and especially under Liz uh, Royer's um, leadership on uh, Vermont Wool Water. A refreshed steering community has recruited new members and created a new website. That way, uh, if something goes down, potentially we can loan operators and stuff. It's it's a FEMA thing. It covers liability and pay and other issues. Um, Vermont Warren is distributed over 10,000 clock max provided by FEMA. 
and uh, advocated for vaccine prioritization, partnered with EPA and ANR to increase emergency preparedness. Um, so that's basically my more or less prepared uh, comments in the last uh, 30 minutes. Um, since this was well, really short. I, I appreciate you jumping in. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great information in there. Um, would you be able to sometime today, um, uh, you know, so that you're comfortable sharing it, uh, turn that into something that you can send to the committee? Because I think it would be helpful for us to have those facts and figures at hand so that we could re uh, read through it again. And, and um, so, you know, what I'm taking away is that the system has, um, uh, well, it was stressed prior to COVID. Um, and it's responded well to the challenge, but it is more under more pressure than I appreciated prior to this conversation. Uh, and that some of that comes out of uh, decreased volumetric charges that bring you revenues. And some of that comes out of arrearages and that you were not included in as many uh, in all the arrearages programs. So is there an arrearages uh, need from your point of view currently? Like if, if the legislature, for instance, continues this for other utilities that we should be thinking about public water uh, and public uh, wastewater. Correct. And we really appreciate this opportunity. Once again, just because we're below ground, I mean, it's most generally the most expensive thing in your town that you can't even begin to imagine this facility yep. alone is a hundred million dollars to replace or other facilities 60 to 80 million dollars and that doesn't even begin to touch the expensive part which are the pipes it was built like the eisenhower you know highway system over time these are very very expensive systems highly complicated i, I encourage you to take a tour when we're allowed to give tours again obviously we're not yeah, yeah. people sure. in. um senator westman um i did bring up um i think yesterday um, that um, the uh, rearages program for utilities ran out of money mm -hmm. and, um, and there wasn't enough. So as we talk about the COVID money going forward and whatever comes down, if there's any opportunities for us to weigh in on that um, with um, an appropriations committee, that would probably be good. Great. All right, thank you. And since you're on a probes, you'll be in the room. It does help to have someone from this committee in that room when those conversations come up. So thank you. But we'll do something more official than just count on you to, um, you know, Jen, fairly often, we'll be putting together a letter uh, that relates to um, financial impacts and forwarding it on to the um, Appropriations Committee. So. All right. Um, anything more you'd say, like to I'll add? I was able to say a rearage. That's a tough word. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, anything else you'd like to, to add? And I, again, I appreciate that you uh, uh, jumped right in to respond to our request for information. Um, if you want to, um, you know, I think the other thing too is for everyone here, uh, don't be shy about reaching back out to us. We're doing a quick survey now to sort of see the state of the state around the, this kind of critical infrastructure um, with an eye to make sure that there's not a problem that we weren't aware of. I'd say there's a little more of a problem here than I was aware of, so this is good. And then also, well, okay, how do we address it in the uh, coming year? You know, what kind of adjustments do we need to be, to be making? And a rear just seems like a, a piece of the puzzle, but some of these things are bigger than just arrearages. Um, so, uh, for instance, the, the rebuilding of uh, old infrastructure that is, uh, need, you know, it's just an like ongoing capital commitment that every municipality is, uh, I don't know that anyone is feeling entirely on top of their, their water systems. No, I think Jeff Wenberg always quotes it best that their uh, one of their main two lines coming in from I guess Chittenden Reservoir into Rutland uh, is you know it's still operating well, but it, it it was the four year project took six because they had to pause two years during the Civil War. Um, <laughs> they also have a, a 
I know that he introduced, I think, a million dollars a year to get your pipes. Your pipes can aid generally 60, 80 years is all you're going to get out of them. I think to get within all their pipes within the 80 year span, it was going to take 100 years still. Mm -hmm. So these are really expensive things that do amazing things for the environment. And, you know, that's why we encourage building in, you know, building in because we can treat new things, new things. We don't produce PFOS or any of those things. They come to us. Everything comes to us. Right. And we got to deal with them. Right. Well, and you're touching on uh, another piece of the puzzle for this committee. We've already discussed it just briefly, and we'll be getting into it as the session moves forward, is the biosolids that are produced. You know, uh, some people sort of point the finger at the facilities, and I would say, you know, like, no, turn that finger around 180 degrees. It's all coming from us. You just happen to be aggregating it, and it's, you know, it's, it's our problem to solve, not your problem to solve. It is. And, and there can be also, once again, as, as you all know, the unintended and how difficult these things are. But for instance, I mean, I'm only speculating, but if we had a very strong PFAS limit on our influence, um, it would be against our national, like it would be against federal law for us to take inceptage more or less because it has a higher level. It would be in conflict with our permit for taking the pollutant. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. Any uh, committee questions for Mr. Fisher? Okay. Well, thank you again. And uh, again, when you're feeling uh, ready to submit something, please do. Uh, if you send it right to, to uh, Jude Newman, she'll distribute it to the committee and put it on our website. So others who are interested in the topic can uh, read about it as well. Thank you. Um, Mr. Duncan, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Senator Bray. Good morning, Senators. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here today. Um, the, uh, I am the general manager at the Champlain Water District. I'm also a member of the Green Mountain Water Environment Association as, as Mike and Bob have indicated. As you may or may not know, CWD is a wholesale water supplier to 12 municipal water systems in Chittenden County. Uh, we do not supply Burlington. Uh, we serve around the Burlington area. Uh, we serve around 75,000 people with an average daily use of about nine and a half million gallons a day uh, in consumption. Uh, to our 12 skirt system. So um, we are Vermont's largest water system, but I, so uh, my background here is, uh, is speaking to the water sector, although I have a, a good handle on the wastewater and stormwater side as well, but, you know, giving you some perspective specifically from the water side. Also, you know, my world right now is, is our 12 surf systems in Chittenden County, but we do have a very good pulse in relationship with Burlington, as well as, uh, a lot of the smaller systems around. So uh, some of our challenges are a little different because of the scale that we have um, compared to some smaller systems. But all in all, I think the issues that we're facing are, are no different than, than the others. And I think it really depends on your demographics and your size that will dictate how impacted you are in COVID in one particular area or another. Um, one of the interesting things I think that came out of COVID immediately for us is, is the concept that um, in the world of FEMA and emergencies, we have always been identified as a critical lifeline, essential for sustaining public health, uh, fire suppression, uh, economic activity, protecting the environment. Um, it's basically all the functions needed to sustain a community. Um, but for some reason, we don't fall into the essential um, worker category. And I realize I'm not in any way, shape or form saying that we are any more important than the public health frontline individuals or the uh, or those giving emergency aid on the front line, by all means, they they deserve uh, an incredible amount of respect for everything that they've done. However, as, as you've indicated, the drinking water and wastewater are kind of, I turn my tap on, I get water. I flush my toilet, it goes away. These are things that just happen. And uh, they don't just happen, obviously, right? We've got, uh, we've got hundreds of people around the state who are working diligently to get there. So it struck me as odd that even FEMA didn't consider uh, water and wastewater operators as essential workers during this. And so there is a gap there that, that we have yet to be acknowledged as that. I think that to me um, needs to happen because I think we often get forgotten and uh, I'll put the, you know, the VCAP program out there as an example, great program was born out of a concept of my understanding um, supporting uh, electrical uh, 
power companies and making sure that they have the revenues that they need to, to be sustained. Um, and the water and, and wastewater were an afterthought in that regard. Uh, yet it was an amazing program that provided incredible benefits. And, and as uh, Senator Westman noted, uh, that program ran out of money. Um, and the water and wastewater systems were late to getting into that game. But when we did, we used it. Um, we provide service to uh, the city of South Burlington as a contracted operator for them, in addition to providing them wholesale water. Um, they, they normally see around 8% in delinquents. They're currently seeing around 20% in delinquencies. Um, South Burlington received about 13,000 in VCAP assistance. We got involved in November and we're only, you know, we're only able to dole out 13,000 before it ended at the end of the year. Uh, right now, we have about 44,000 in aging accounts that are 30 to 120 days delinquent. So there's still a need in that rearages world. Um, and we would envision that if that program was rolled out again, that, that we would see uh, a lot of those rearages um, being taken advantage of. So we strongly support. And as, as Bob had said, the city of Burlington is, is in that boat as well. I think what you'll find for at least our surf systems, and this is why I think demographics make a difference, um, Champlain Water District, when the pandemic hit, we did not see a decrease in our wholesale water sales. Uh, we actually didn't really see too much of a decrease in any of the 12 systems we sold water to. Um, the dynamics there are the majority of the places we serve, South Shelburne, South Burlington, Williston, Jericho, Milton, Colchester, Winooski, they, they are bedroom communities, if you will, um, relative to the city of Burlington. And I realize Burlington has a large residential component, but Burlington also has a, a large economic um, non-residential uh, service. And so Burlington is in a position where you heard from Bob, where they are looking at dipping into capital reserves. Uh, water and wastewater are typically billed on a volumetric basis. You pay for what you use. There may be some fixed fees in there for or a uh, similar to your electric rate where you pay a small portion, but the rest is volumetrically based on gallons that you use. And so uh, for Burlington, seeing UVM take a, take a nosedive in, in number of students there and therefore water sales, uh, the businesses in the Church Street area, as well as other businesses in that area, they are what would kind of be considered our major metro system, which is something you're seeing happen nationally, LA, um, Dallas, these larger cities, they have become void of, of life, but all the people in the in the bedroom communities, those surf systems are seeing either stable or increased usage because of the fact that um, the people are staying home. Uh, either kids are not going to school potentially, so they're they're at home doing that as well as working from home. So from CWD's perspective, we stayed stable in our water sales and economically and financially, we are doing, doing fine. Um, we have seen some uh, uh, challenges with our cash flow, which is basically because our our systems are basically our customers. So uh, those municipalities are going to pay. They're they're you know that's 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 the way this arrangement is, and they're also a very responsible entity. Those systems are getting their money from their ratepayers. So as they're seeing a decline in revenue or a low turnover in in people paying their rates, we're seeing them start to pay theirs where they used to. As soon as we send out a bill, we'd get a we get a payment from almost all 12 of our surf systems. Now, some of them are paying right off, some of them are paying a little bit later. And, and really that is tied to demographics. As an example, the town of Williston, um, they, they have not seen any real change in delinquencies. They've always had a very small amount of delinquencies. They have not seen any change at all in, uh, in their delinquencies or in their water use. City of Winooski, on the other hand, has seen a, a major uptick and their, um, in their delinquencies, um, they were usually uh, usually around 9% of uh, delinquent in their, as of, I think, November, they were in the, the upper 20% delinquency rate. And, and honestly, it, it is income demographic based. Imagine the town of Wilson uh, is a different type of income demographic than the city of Winooski. And so, although we may be, um, we may be fine as a wholesaler. What we see going on in our surf system is very representative of what we what we are aware of. And talking to Liz Roy of Vermont World Water, who represents a lot of the smaller systems, um, 
if you've if you've got a uh, a low income community, those communities are struggling with making payments. So there's issues that come with that. In that, um, are they now going to be willing to make the investments that they needed to make before COVID, uh, either during COVID or any time after COVID? So what we heard from Bob and and mentioned yourself is infrastructure is aging. It's been a problem in our in our water systems forever. Um, Champlain Water District is is blessed by the fact that we were started in 1973, and we have young pipes. We have pipes that were put in in the in the 70s. Um, I consider them very young. I was born in 72, so when those pipes are considered old, I'm going to be considered old. Um, but until then, I'm still young. But you know, you've got all these all these water systems and wastewater as well that have have should have been investing in there, similar to what you, you heard for Jeff Winberg when he was in Rutland, looking at putting a million dollars a year in and still not being able to resolve all the needs until 80 years out. Unfortunately, that is where Vermont is at with its majority of its infrastructure. So COVID has issues right up front where people are unable to pay their bills and we're seeing arrearages and we need some assistance for that. Then I strongly believe that there is should be some sort of economic stimulus that comes down the line somewhere to help in the infrastructure um, rebuilding piece because people are going, people are deferring. We are not Champlain Water District. We happen to be in a healthy financial position. And, and what's, what's unfortunate is right now the Drinking Water SRF program has a uh, loan forgiveness program where they'll forgive the first, um, the, the 775% of the first million of your project and then 25% thereafter, which is an incredible subsidy. Fortunately, a lot of people aren't able to take advantage of that because they're not feeling in a comfortable financial position to move projects forward and make those kind of investments. And so I see a strong need as we come out of um, COVID to look to reinvest in our infrastructure, one, because it's absolutely needed, two, because it will help the community start to chip away at their infrastructure problems. Three, it will also, it creates jobs, businesses, activities, um, people to work. There's uh, there's so many benefits to that that uh, for me I see that as something that really needs to needs to happen coming out of this. So, um, the other thing I will say that was a real benefit to us is um, we had to do a lot of facility modifications to in order to make sure that we could keep the staff here. You know, we we de-densified the plant to start. Um, we have to keep it running twenty four seven, but in order to get back to to not just keeping it running, but to try and keep ahead. Uh, we put investments in the building to, to modify offices, to modify spaces, improve ventilation, access. Um, so we spent some money on that, but we were able to take advantage of the local government expense reimbursement grant program. I thought that was that was really a, uh, a great program that helped us, and I'm aware of other communities that took advantage of that. I don't know where people are at now with needing to... Um, to look at their facilities or if they even stop to look at how they should uh, modify their facilities to address COVID. Uh, we were able to do that because we are, we were staffed that we have the, the man, the staffing and manpower to do that. Um, so I don't know if an LGR is, is another um, consideration out there for, for others, but um, we found that to be very useful during COVID. Okay. So. okay. Um, well, I'm just sure. looking around the room. Senator McDonald. Uh, would, would, you, would someone explain loan forgiveness to me? Um, how is that different from a grant? Uh, so so the, the state of Vermont Drinking Water SRF does not have grants within their, uh, within their, um, their structure for whatever reason, whether it's written in there or not. I'm not sure exactly why they, they aren't able to give grants. So what they do is they essentially create a grant by giving um, the amount of the uh, of the loan, so once we once we close on the project, well, this is a we, non grant grant. Is that what it is? You got it, yes, sir. So why don't we just why do we not call it that? That is a great question, and I would encourage you to to ask the uh, the uh, drinking water SRF program um, why it is it's a it's a grant in in sheep's clothing. My my other question, which is less uh just more smart alec is um 
why don't you sell your water system to a, um, you know, an investor owned utility and let them operate it? Uh, well, we, as far as Champlain Water District is concerned, uh, we are able to, to operate it uh, with the foresight in mind to, uh, to invest in our infrastructure as we go along. So we, we don't see the need to bring in a private entity to run it for, uh, for profit. I suppose, that to me, once it gets into the hands of a private entity, you become you become tied up in the uh, public service utility board, um, in the, the all the things that come with that. I, I'm sure GM, not to knock GMP, but um, we have the ability to to work through our rates and, and everything else on a on a public voter basis as opposed to a, a public utility service board basis. So, I, a local control, I think, is a much better place to be than. Uh, and tying it to the utility board on a, on a state well, level. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was, I'm trying to understand how the, the issues that the witnesses, real issues the witness is bringing to us and how they might differ from the public service of broadband use and, and um, why we have different policies in place when they're both public service issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator McCormick, any, anything? All right, Senator Westman or Senator Campion, any questions for uh, Mr. Duncan? All right, well, great. Well, um, so, you know, the, I guess this, <laughs> I'll ask a question. It's, uh, it's uh, always a bit of a puzzle to me, but uh, that when we have programs like the loan forgiveness on a, uh, loan sent to SRF or uh, very low rates um, that there's not a higher uptake rate. And I, I don't know if you chalk that up to human nature or that municipalities or, or citizens are just not that drawn to approving a bond for something that's going to be a benefit for the next 30 years as opposed to the next 30 months or days, you know, are we dealing mostly with human nature or are we dealing with municipal budgets that are really that stressed that even quote unquote free money is hard to use? I, well, I think it's tied to municipal budgets being stressed, but that is because there isn't the, the, the wherewithal within the community to accept increase in rates. And that's for a variety of reasons. I, I'm always, troubled by the fact that uh, people's cable bills are are higher than their water bills, but they can't seem to live without their cable. But if they found out they didn't have water, it's that's really where the where the true need is. But the, the value of water is really underestimated in it. And I think it often, and, and maybe that's one of the challenges for being a municipally owned entity is that people look to the municipality to keep things low. And I think we keep things artificially low um, and ultimately we are going to pay the, the piper in the end. You say pay now or pay later perspective. I think if you look around the state at, at where water rates are, um, we have extremely low water rates and that's to me attributed to the fact that we haven't made the investments in infrastructure we need to. So to me, it's a matter of the boards with not being willing to put forth a program and a rate uh, in fear of not being supported by their voters and constituents. Uh -huh. So this is a little outside of the pandemic. Uh, well, one piece of this is right within it, and another piece is outside the pandemic. Um, there was concern at some point that water uh, effluent from wastewater treatment facilities would still have um, active coronavirus in it. So I, I, it's not my impression. I don't know if if, uh, can you say something about the capacity and the, the intended capacity of a wastewater treatment facility to deal with pathogens? I don't know if it was ever designed to handle coronavirus or it's a surprise that it could make it through the system to you. Uh, yeah, so to, to answer the question, the, uh, the coronavirus makes it into the sewer through, through bodies shedding it. Um, and therefore makes it to the treatment plant. But the treatment plant is set up to kill pathogens in primarily through either the use of, through disinfection, either through UV 
uh, chlorine or some combination thereof or some other uh, oxidizer, chlorine and, or UV in the, in the state of Vermont. And so any, any uh, wastewater going through and being discharged into any of our receiving streams from a, uh, from a wastewater treatment plant is COVID has been treated through the disinfection process. So it's been designed to handle those kind of pathogens. And reversely, on the water side, uh, our source is, is free of, of COVID given the, the location and depth that we're at. But we also are required to disinfect prior to sending it out. So ultimately, um, our water system and most water systems who use a form of disinfection um, don't have COVID introduced in low drinking water or into the receiving. Yeah. And hi, if I could just make a yeah. comment. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. So, yeah, this is a, this was a concern at the beginning. It's been looked at the national level and it does appear to be that uh, everything's showing that it, it, what, they're, what you're tracking is messenger RNA. It's pieces of it. It's a fairly uh, brittle um, virus. So when it enters the wastewater system, even by the time it gets to the facilities, it's generally non-viable uh, is what they've been finding from WEF and CDC um, guidance. The, the pieces of it is how they can track, use it for tracking. Obviously, they've had this technology for many years to track. Um, there are other issues. There's civil liberty issues, et cetera. I mean, you could theoretically put one on any on everyone's house and you'd know who's got it first, you know who has cancer. You'd also know who's doing drugs or something and then they'd probably go in their yard, um, which wouldn't be good. So there's civil liberty issues, but uh, yes, the, the facilities. And then once they enter them, it's no different than any other pathogen. Um, that's, why, that's why they're here. I mean, it's become focused on the environment, but that's not why any money was ever spent to put these facilities here in the 60s when it's all public health. You know, okay. it's tolerant. There's everything coming down, all the waterborne illnesses. That's that's the primary purpose of, the, of, of all the money that was ever spent on wastewater. Um, the environmental benefits are just, you know, were recognized later on. Sure. So the, um, you know, to whether it's credit or blame, this committee last year worked on PFAS and PFAS testing for public water supplies. Um, but I do have the concern that, you know, I, one way of looking at that is an unfunded mandate. So, and I think we're, there are other chemicals of concern that, you know, the more we learn, the more we see that there are things out there to be aware of. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, so this is off COVID really, but what's your take on uh, the level of support or lack thereof for testing for sort of a growing panel of tests that the state believes is necessary to protect public health. Can you say something about that? Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, from the, PIPA, the PFAS has been a, an issue for a lot of our systems within, within Vermont. The, uh, you know, to put things into perspective, you know, we are Champ a Champlain Water District. We do nine and a half million gallons a day. There's 400 community water systems, and on average, they produce less than 5,000 gallons per day. So you can imagine that the majority of community water systems in Vermont are very small. So to put an unfunded mandate out there to test for PFAS, um, testing costs can really create a financial burden on those systems um, to test for that. And... Uh, it's also challenging too because you know PFAS is not a naturally occurring element. So anything that these water systems are, when they're looking for these, they're they're looking for, for elements that have been introduced, not naturally. So it's uh, something that they've fortunately inherited in the water system by actions of, of others. So it's uh, that unfunded mandate significantly impacts the financial, um, the finances and budgets of a majority of the community out there. Okay. And yes. how about the, are the, do you anticipate, I mean, I have the sense just from the uh, time that I've been in the legislature, which isn't that long, but 13 years, uh, you know, that we, it's uh, like every other year, we, we realize there's something else that's a risk. And then we, we either initially want to inventory that risk by requiring a, a one-off round of testing, or it becomes part of the regular panel of ongoing tests. So um, I'm trying to have a sense of if, 
if you've had conversations in the past about having support for this base, uh, higher level of overhead, or if the state can play a helpful role in doing this other than uh, defining tests that ought to be carried out. And Senator, yeah. uh, we, we've at Green Mountain Water Environment level, um, we've made comments on you know several of those types of uh, initiatives our comments in general always say that we think it's a, a great idea to do the investigation to find out how big of a problem this is, et cetera, et cetera. But as getting back to what Joe Duncan was saying, the problem really is funding. Um, it's not really a problem with funding for some systems, but for the much vast majority of Vermont systems, they simply don't have the, the resources uh, to do that kind of testing. So typically our comments will say, good idea, uh, tr let's try to come up with a strategy that limits costs as much as possible. So in other words, you don't over test if you think that's actually possible. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, try to come up with some sort of a funding mechanism for the small systems, which is really the majority of systems in Vermont. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. I know that I was out walking, walking a dog. And so when I was digging out a valve uh, here in Bristol and, and it was the operator for the system town. And she said, it's great that you're testing, but please don't add any more tests, you know, because they're expensive. Yeah, one other thing to add on that, and that's what I was gonna mention Senator Bray is, one of the things that's happening with a lot of this is uh, you know, we used to we used to deal with parts per million, and then we went to parts per billion, and now we're going to parts per trillion, and and those are looking for grains of sand and on a beach when you get into parts per trillion. And what comes with that is cost. The other thing that comes with that is a lot of, and Mike can speak more to this because he's our director of water quality and production here at the plant. A lot of those tests are not tests by by uh, labs that can be done locally or regionally. And so you're really adding significant costs. It's not, it's not like, hey, I can just take this down to the Vermont Department of Health and, uh, and get this done and, uh, and move on, um, which is actually, uh, from a COVID perspective, is, is also an issue for a lot of the small systems where the, the health lab had to reshift its priorities and not accept water samples. And therefore, the, they do it at a very low cost. And now you've got to send it to a private lab. So there's cost impacts COVID-wise yeah. on that. But um, I forgot to mention that. But keeping on task with the with the PFAS, um, you're you're not. It's not as simple as just grabbing a sample, sending it out, and uh, and getting a result back. There's finding the labs that do it, finding the the, the right parameters to, sh to collect it, ship it, send it to them, and then the cost associated with uh, with getting that that result back. So, so um, can you just ballpark a figure? What is a you know one test? costs and maybe you can't just do one you have to do a series in order to get reliable data i don't know how this works mike can you speak to that yeah depending upon the uh the contaminant that's being discussed and whether there's actually a method that exists for it or not because in some cases methods don't even exist so uh in a case where a method doesn't exist the costs could be uh, upwards of five hundred or seven hundred dollars for one sample. Um, once the method is is uh, developed, and it's it's usually EP, it's always EPA that develops a method, and labs have the ability to test for it. And then there's more uh, tests that they do. The cost could come down into the three to five hundred dollar range, um, and it and it really depends upon the method that EPA um, develops. EPA now has uh, two different methods for the, the different PFOSs. Um, you know, there's so many PFOSs that have been created over the years uh, by industry that one could envision they could end up with three or four different methods. Each one of those methods would be uh, charged separately uh, by labs and very few of the local labs have the capability to do those testing methods. Okay. So with PFAS being just one of the tests, can you just give us a, a, an idea of over the course of a year, how many tests would be run 
for all things you must test and, and what the cost would be. I mean, I don't know if we're talking about a thousand or 10,000 or. Uh, well, for our budget, uh, we, it would be in the tens of thousands of dollars uh, that we run testing for. Um, okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of small water systems, uh, it's a really substantial impact upon their budget when you're starting to talk about tens of thousands of dollars of costs. Um, we, we, we submitted uh, comments on, uh, there's, there was one um, requirement that came up regarding, um, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology of it, but it was regarding testing for uh, contaminants that have a, a Vermont health advisory for them, but don't have an MCL. So there's no, there's no routine monitoring for them. They're typically looked for when a source is developed in a, under other specific circumstances, but not routinely. Uh, and there were calculations done by the uh, Vermont DEC on what the average would be for any water system that had to do all those testing, all that testing and it was a significant cost. The number doesn't jump into my mind, but uh, I believe it was in the, it was in the, um, Bob, do you recall what that number was, Joe? It, I believe it was- Yeah, I was 10, trying to pull it up now. It was 10, in, it was 10, 10 to 15,000, I yeah. believe, yeah. Uh, for just one round of testing. Yeah, I mean, here in South Burlington, we pay 12,000 a year just for enteric virus testing. That's just one test. That's not PFOS, that's not metals, anything else. Senator McDonald. How much do you spend for all your water testing um, combined? To, to Bob? Um, off the top of my head, 25000 at least here in South Burlington. A very top of my head. That's not, in, let me take that back. That is the test that we send out, the more difficult test. We have, uh, an, we have a laboratory here with a, a, a staff member that does all our in-house testing and, you know, with benefits, that's easily a $100,000 position right there. A lot of the smaller facilities don't have the capacity to have a laboratory like we do, so they have to send out everything. I, um, I thank you, because I've tried it. You know, what's happened in the last uh, 30 years is the, the private sector's um, done very well in, in selling bottled water. And, and you know, I wonder how much the same constituency pays for bottled water compared to how much it spends or doesn't spend on local water testing. And the more people are dissatisfied or worried about the quality of their water, the more bottled water they buy. It seems to be a, you know, I wonder what those connections are, but um, you know, you're, Paying, you're paying for people who can afford it are paying for clean water one way or another, uh, and then others are stuck with what comes out of the tap. Yep. A lot of that's just um, marketing. That water's not any cleaner than Champlain District water. <laughs> sure. right. No one, no one ever went broke marketing. <laughs> it worked well for them. Yes. Okay. Um, well, th thank you. So this has been very helpful. And uh, anyone, uh, any of our guests, yeah, any other things come to mind while we've been having this conversation you'd like to share with the committee before we wrap up for the day? Um, very quickly, uh, Green Mountain yeah. does have a PFOS document. I'll attach that with my comments too. Um, okay. that obviously PFOS is a terrible thing, but I mean, it needs to be addressed at the sources. And I mean, 30 parts per trillion, you know, it's, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. It's obviously something that's bad, but the average blood level in the United States uh, is 4,300 parts per trillion for P PFOS and 1,100 parts for PFOA, American Red Cross 2017. So, I mean, it's ubiquitous everywhere. Um, the average P PFOA and household dust is between 10,000 and 50,000 50, parts per trillion. So that's what it's in dust, 10,000 to 50,000 parts per trillion. And obviously you want to keep it out of the drinking water everywhere you can. It has decreased significantly since they outlawed, you know, some of the, um, back in the 90s, some of the longer chain ones. But there's all sorts of, um, like, once again, there's no easy solutions. There's nothing right. black and white. Yeah. Senator McCormick. Thank you. I just, I want to 
basically feed back to you what I think I heard you saying, just to verify that I've got you right. If I understand you, you are not really hopeful of an ability to filter PFC out of PFAS out of the water. That the, so if there's a solution, it's to put to not put it in in the first place. Well, that's by far the cost effective solution. And it's always the solution. No, there is ability to filter it out. Um, they've been working very diligently. It's a very expensive systems. You can pry a lot, you can heat it up above 1200 C. Um, there is uh, filters, granular activated carbon. There are ways to get it out. That's that is another reason why we encourage building in because once again, people on septic tanks, that's going right in their yard and they're there. They couldn't possibly get a system on there to take it out. But at this level you can, and some, some, uh, some facilities nationwide already, already in, enacting that. Okay. Thank you. Right. Well, uh, it's not very scientific, but I'm back to my cat in the hat with a spot that you can't get rid of uh, thing. We've been wrestling for a couple of years with, even when you do have a system that cleans it out, like activated, uh, charcoal systems and then that charcoal ends up in a landfill that then produces leachate that then becomes influent to a wastewater treatment facility that then sends it uh, in some degree back out the other end so we we keep passing it around but uh, uh, I don't know that we've been very smart uh, I'm not <laughs> saying anyone here is not smart as a society we haven't been very smart about handling it so far uh, protecting ourselves from ourselves really so. Yeah, yes, that, that's the reason we 100% support any any actions that can stop the creation of PFAS. Because until we get that under control, there are, will be impacts to water systems. And then we, if we can eliminate that, then we have only to deal with the impacts that are currently there, which is not a very positive thing, but at least it stops. You need to stop this cause. If you don't stop the cause, there will be others. That's, that is my, my biggest thing. There are methods to deal with it in the environment. They're not pleasant. They're not cost effective. And the most cost effective way is to stop putting it into our environment. Right. Right. Well, this goes along with biocell. It's the same thing. Yeah. You can landfill it, but you got the leachate coming around. You can land apply it. There may be some impacts on the land. It's, you know, it's a small acreage here, like a thousand acres or so. I think maybe less than 2000, yeah, but there's, there's really no easy solution, and I'm, I'm well known, and, and I know that, that Joe and Mike are both going to cringe, but my speech is always, there is, you know, with the 410 pounds a year, there is only one really solution that works, and that's internal composting. I've been holding it for several days now. I don't feel well, but that's really your only option that's going to stop it going into the environment. <laughs> um, well, and, you know, the, the thing that this committee has made some progress on, but not enough is to tie some of the responsibility back to the companies producing these materials. Because when it becomes a cost of creating the material, people become motivated to either stop making it or make something, um, you know, like our program around batteries and paints. If you're gonna produce this stuff and then have a, a role in dealing with end of life, you may produce it a little differently or uh, produce it not at all. So, um, all right, well, great. Well, if, um, if you gentlemen don't have anything more to, that you'd like to share with us while we're here, um, thanks so much. And uh, I would ask you to keep an eye on us so that don't be shy if you feel like these issues continue to concern you during the next several months while we're in session and you're not seeing enough progress on something. Uh, please chime in and help us um, be aware and advocate for uh, better work, you know, on our, our side of the street here. Um, and with that, uh, we are uh, finished with taking testimony for today. And I'll just turn to the committee to see if anyone has any questions or comments uh, before we wrap up for the morning. Senator McCormick. And just an observation, this whole thing with the PFAS is analogous to our solid waste law in general, which is that the priorities are reduce, reuse, recycle. And the way most people have responded to that is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Yeah, recycling is a good idea. Let's recycle. And of course, 
you wouldn't have anything to recycle if you did a, if we did a better job at, at reducing and reusing. Otherwise, not on this issue. Are you ready for just committee business, technical business, Mr. Chairman? Or yeah, do you want to stay yes. on the? You're ready no, for I think, technical. And unless anyone had more waste oriented uh, or drinking water oriented stuff to deal with, we would just move on to committee business and then wrap after that. Okay. Thank you. Now that we're on Zoom, are, are we going to be continuing? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Jim. Well, I just want to make sure that you don't feel impolite if you decide to check out now, uh, Joe, Mike, and, and Bob. Thanks. Uh, Thank you're you. welcome to stay, but don't feel obligated to stay in any way. If there are no further questions. I, I thank you for, for having us. We look forward to potential opportunities in the future. And uh, thank you, Jude, for uh, setting this up with us. Okay. And thank you so much for, and uh, once again, we're a resource and yes, I got pagers and phones and email. Yeah, I got to go. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Right. Chairman, be, being new yeah. on this, shall I? Yes, please. Being new on this committee, uh, I'm, on my previous committees on my uh, iPad screen, I had two uh, little symbols look like capital domes. And one was my morning committee and one was my afternoon committee where there was a, a, a complete record of all the testimony that had been submitted in, in writing and, and, and all the agendas. Are we, is that being developed for, the, for this committee now? Um, you know, I, we hadn't, I haven't done that in the past, but I think legislative IT can, uh, I think basically you're installing a shortcut on your home screen that yeah, would take yeah. you to the root, right to the root of the committee page, right? Okay. So um, I, I should go to IT to get that done. I would ask them to, uh, the, the way to add that new shortcut right to the Senate natural page. Um, and I'm on a, a, okay. a desktop machine. So if I knew the answer, I would happily share it with you, but I'm not, I'm not generally on my iPad most of the time. So. Okay. And are we using the same number from now on, the same Zoom number to get into the meetings or? Yeah, so that's a good question. You know, I, I honestly, I haven't been that attentive to it because Jude sends us an invite and then yeah. I just click through and there I am. So I haven't, I haven't noticed if we're getting a new, um, meeting ID each day or not. Jude, do you know the answer to that? I, I'm guessing if you're scheduling them one by one, it comes up with a new ID each time and we just use the email you send us each day. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know if it, like you, I've never really looked at those numbers. I just send out the invitation. If, if you put it in your calendar, you'll have it there, you know, forever. <laughs> so that's what you know, then it, so it, well, I, I don't need it forever unless we're using the same number every day. Yeah, right. So I, I'll check into it. I'll check with IT, but I, I, okay. I don't know the answer to that. Right. Thanks. I mean, so we each have similar but not identical setups. In my case, I get an email from June and asks if I would like to accept that meeting. When I click on accept, it puts it right into my calendar. Right. And then. I just look at my calendar, click on the meeting, and I scroll down till I see the Zoom link yeah. and one more click and I'm here. So that's my routine. Um, yeah, and in some ways, if you lose that email, it's, you know, it, that's a safe way to, if you get off or something, you can go back to that, eat that calendar and click on it again. Right, right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so thanks for asking. Um, so Shadi's really good on this stuff, Senator McCormick. Yeah. Um, so tomorrow we'll uh, we're gonna continue on the same path, uh, and we'll also have um, uh, Commissioner Walk will be in, and um, as well as folks from the PUC Department of Public Service, um, and also Tom DePietro from uh, Green Mountain Water. Environment Association, and then John Letty on the solid waste side of things. So we'll, I think we'll be, uh, by the end of tomorrow, we'll have checked most of the boxes in terms of uh, 
who we work with and making sure that they're still fine or what is not fine and what it might mean in terms of program or money for the coming year. Um, and on Friday, we have Lewis Porter. So we'll hear from Fish and Wildlife on their side of things. Uh, and that uh, Commissioner Walk can take us on DEC, uh, Lewis Porter's Fish and Wildlife, and that completes all three operating areas for um, ANR. Uh, next week, we'll start getting reports in and we start getting like the, the annual clean water report. I mean, that's another one. We talked to them during last session. Uh, some water, clean water work got delayed, not canceled. Um, for instance, tree planting and riparian buffers, you know, like they, people were nervous about having people too close together doing that work in the spring. Uh, people ordered in and I think they just delayed plantings to the fall. So, but I don't know the, the, so we should check on the full story, make sure we haven't gotten waylaid on our clean water work. Um, and uh, next week also we'll have the PUC, we'll have the Act 62 report. We should also get the Department of Public Services annual energy update. So those will be helpful for us to start to step into the, uh, the energy side of the uh, work we'll do. Um, and let me pause and just say, uh, I mean, thanks for the meeting the other day where we generated a list of things of interest to people. Um, and uh, I'll be working with Jude building agendas, but uh, it generally falls to the two of us, but it, the, the process is open to everyone. So if there's uh, a witness and an issue uh, that you would like taken up, uh, please let um, me know and Jude know, and um, we'll fit it into our plan of work. Um, and if there, if members of the committee don't have anything else for today, then we are um, Jude. Uh, we will be finished when, when we're done with Jude's question and stuff. Then we'll be done for the morning. Uh, Jude. Yeah, just uh, <clears throat> trying to make it as easy as possible for everybody. And I know that the agenda frequently changes. So I'm suggesting that you go to our committee info pa information page and click on agenda in the morning so that you have the absolute latest one instead of going through all your emails. If that works for you, if you want me to continue sending <clears throat> multiple emails with an agenda update, <clears throat> it's a little different from being in the room where I can just give you a piece of paper. Right. So it's your choice how you want to be notified. Um, okay, I'll speak for myself. I always, because we have people get sick, people cancel, people this, that, and the other thing. Right. I, I, and that can happen right up till we're meeting. I always just use the committee page agenda. So I know I have the current one. I don't know if anyone else if everyone else is fine with that, uh, or if people would like an email from June shortly before we go or something like that. If you do, uh, you don't need to just reach out to Jude or Mom. Yeah, let me. Straight, but otherwise let's use the, the online agenda as the most current. Okay, great. All right, um, well, thank you everyone. And, um, Jude, I'll give you a call uh, about continuing to do agenda building. And um, other than that, we have finished our business for the morning and we are adjourned. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.